Welcome to Coffee, Tea or Sex. I'm Karina Velasco and today it's a great pleasure to have a dear friend, psychotherapist and a coach in women empowerment, Mrs. Eva Clay. Welcome, <laughs> Eva. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and talk with you. Yeah, and we're, we're going to have some tea together and talk about something that I think it's crucial for having a happy, fulfilled life, which is self-love, confidence, and power as a woman. So there's a lack of, you know, that, that self-love because we have a very rude conversation with ourselves. So you coach a lot of women regarding shifting, you know, their value and, and, and their power. How, what, what's the majority of issues or problematics you see with women? Yeah, thanks. I, I work with so many women, and I've been doing this for 20 years, and I think across the board, women have a very tenuous relationship with their body. And in part, it's because, I mean, look at the culture we're living in and the kind of messages that we're inundated with by the media constantly, that our bodies are gross, that they're defective, that they're not big enough, small enough, you name it, that we're not okay as we are as women. And so I find when I start reconditioning women in the way that they perceive their bodies, everything from there begins to shift. So body issues, body image, that's, that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. What is natural? Because sometimes, you know, it's like, I don't want to be skinny, but still I want to feel good. But the shape and form, it depends for every woman. And how can we embrace beauty, being healthy, even if our size is not zero or two, which is what media is telling us, it's how we're gonna be validated in love. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question, and I, I feel like I could talk for weeks and years about that one. Um, I think you know, what's really powerful for women to do is unplug from even seeing the media as an example of what women should look like, and just look around you. Just look around you at your friends and your family and see that women come in all shapes and sizes, that there's not just one ideal form, but that all of us in our diversity are beautiful in our own ways. And one of my favorite things to do, especially when I'm like maybe feeling a little bit low or not happy about my body that day, is I love to go to a spa. You know, when we're in spas, and especially when women are maybe not wearing clothes or we're wearing just a bathing suit or something, you really see the diversity of women's bodies and how they're all beautiful. And we can then begin to interject or to take that sense of beauty and place it on ourselves. What's the source of beauty that it's not exterior? Where, where, where does the beauty irradiate? Mm -hmm. from? Mm. That's a good question. And that's where we begin to talk about confidence. Because when a woman has confidence and she's worked skillfully to develop that inner sense of esteem, then the way that she looks becomes less important. And she radiates beauty from the inside out. That she feels not only confident, but competent and valuable and valued in her community. And then it's all right if we age, it's all right if we have some wrinkles, it's all right if we have cellulite or bulges, because we know our worth and we know that we're making a meaningful contribution to our community. How can we develop that sense of confidence? Because I think the lack of confidence or self-esteem comes from a lot of thought forms and belief systems that we were you know, programmed to believe and that automatically like lowers our value as a woman. So if I'm feeling not desired, not valued, not in my power, what is a startup for me to gain more confidence? What are those tools you could recommend? Yeah, that's such a great question. Well, I think first of all, as women, we need to, um, to recognize that there actually is a commercial conspiracy to make us feel bad about ourselves. So we buy stuff? We, so that we buy stuff. So we're constantly being told, and, and this is subtle, it's insidious, and I think 
we desensitize to it even. But um, modern society is always telling us that we are lacking in something. Therefore, as a consumer, we need to buy their product in order to be whole and in order to be loved. Mm. And so just recognizing that, we, you know, we begin to see the forces that are shaping the way we see ourselves. And then secondarily, I want to give you a really quick tip for how to boost your confidence when you need it. Um, and it's this idea of mastery. So I'm kind of like a brain science geek, so I'm going to drop a little brain science on you. This idea of mastery, um, mastery means you're good at something and you know it, basically. And that you're good at it because you've worked hard to get good at it. And it can be something even simple like riding a bike or cooking. Maybe you bake really beautiful cakes or... Ironing, which oh, yeah. is really complex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can be something on a small scale or a large scale. Maybe you play a musical instrument very beautifully. Um, but the brain generalizes mastery. It does not compartmentalize. So when you're good at one thing, it gives the brain a boost that you are capable of being good at everything. Mm. So when you focus on one thing that you really love to do and that you know you're good at, the brain will begin to borrow that sense of competency from that one task and spread it out and diversify it through the rest of your brain and through your consciousness. So if you just take a breath and really like allow yourself to ruminate on this one thing that you're good at, you'll get a quick boost of confidence. And then you can bring that energy or that confidence to something maybe new that you're learning or to a different task or a date even. Totally. Absolutely. So when you're looking in the mirror and you're getting ready for a date and you're going, oh my gosh, I don't look perfect or there's something wrong with me. My cellulite. <laughs> right, or this is too big or this is too small, you know, the way that women do. Um, literally just close your eyes, take a breath and think about that thing you're good at. You know, maybe you're good at dancing. I personally love dancing. And, and you're really good at it. And I, well, I, cause I love it. And um, I think about that, well, like if I'm good at dancing, then I'll be good at other things too. And if I'm really good at dancing, then it won't matter as much how I look because I know that I'm capable and competent. Also, I feel like a lot of our self-esteem, we uh, bring that to the external world. That means that <clears throat> if we get validated or applauded by something we do that it's good, we feel good. Mm -hmm. But if nobody is validating or loving what we do, like it goes down. Mm -hmm. So I think in this case, when you do something you love, it really doesn't matter what people say or think. Totally. So how can we empower ourselves not to give our, the power away to other people to dictate if we can love ourselves or not? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, and I'm going to answer it in two ways. Number one, I want to normalize that in part, especially true for women, we draw our self-esteem based on how others respond to us. And that's kind of built in neurologically. Oh, really? Yeah, it's built in. That explains so, a lot. Right? Yeah. So this is why I really love sharing this with women, is because we can stop blaming ourselves for being needy or dependent on other people's opinion and just know it's part of our evolutionary wiring that we need to feel like we're a value or an asset to the tribe. And we are told, we are informed of our value to the tribe based on the way other people respond to us. So there's like a mirror effect that goes on. Mm. So number one, we can normalize that and say there's nothing wrong with you if you like to be validated or complimented. Of course, everybody enjoys that. It's okay. And everyone feels better when they're reinforced. Um, but secondarily, like to answer your question, how do we kind of step around that and validate ourselves? Um, number one, for women especially, is to find the pleasure in everything. Find the pleasure in what you're doing. And when we learn how to really open ourselves and receive the pleasure of any task, whether it be ironing the laundry or baking an amazing cake um, or making love to our beloved, that it becomes less of an act to please other people or to impress other people and more an act of just simply enjoying ourselves. And pleasing ourselves. Pleasing ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's, <clears throat> that's a huge shift. For example, I, I love making chocolates. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. We've I've, tried I've each other's chocolate. Yeah. yeah. 
and and for me it's like there there's this like duality of like I do it because I love to bring joy to the people I love through my chocolates but also it's like pleasure for me like to be able it's like my meditation to be there and put my love in there and then I just eat my chocolates and it doesn't really matter if other people try them or not but when they try them like that validation also supports Feels for good. me. It's it's an inspiration to keep on going. Absolutely. So as women, how can we empower each other in that kind kind of conversations mm -hmm. in order to make us feel better instead of competing or pushing each other? I mean, I, I think you posted a quote the other day in Facebook that said, "Behind a successful woman, it's a tribe of women." of other Powerful. successful women. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it really does take a village, especially for women. Um, women have this thing, so I'm gonna best a little more science to you. Um, it's called tend and befriend. So women have this evolutionary impulse to conjoin with each other. And you know, in the tribal order, we groom each other, we care for each other's children, we feed each other, we share all of our resources with each other. So um, when women compete with one another, we're actually going against our evolutionary programming. And we do this in modern society because there's this fallacy about scarcity, scarcity of resources that, especially around men, you know, that she might be more beautiful than me and she might get the man that I want. You know, at the core, at the heart of it, that's oh, really yeah. what's yes. going on. Yeah, you know, or what's wrong with me that, you know, she's not even that pretty or that successful and she has like a beloved and she's super happy and I'm still single. Right. That, that I, I mean, that's a story too. Yeah. And we compare ourselves in order to measure up. You know, we often get jealous or envious of other women simply by the way that they look. Like, oh, she's got breasts that I don't. Um, and so in order to counteract that and really support each other, I think just look at the way that you might be competing, even subconsciously, with your friends and with other women. Because I notice women in some ways subtly tear each other down. Um, and it is, again, that scarcity belief. And I know for me, I have what I call a praise practice with, my, with all women, actually. I love to lavish them with praise and compliments because I know it puts us at ease, we love to hear that validation, and it opens us and makes us available for a deep connection. So when I see a woman, I might look into her eyes and offer her a genuine and authentic reflection of what I find magnificent about her. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a nice way to start a tea with a friend. <laughs> like to open up and, and, and to boost the confidence. Because we have to understand also our, our uniqueness, and I think that's that's part of building confidence. That I'm I'm a unique being, mm -hmm. and I'm offering something very unique. And everybody's great, you know. Each each one of us have our gifts, and and if we can support each other in that gifts, mm -hmm. that's amazing. There's enough cake cake for everybody. I uh, yeah, you nailed it. There's enough cake for everybody. I think that's the theme of our conversation today: is cake. It's cake. cake, exactly, and confidence. So you cake created and <laughs> cake and confidence. So you created all this um, method to support women to regain confidence and and power. So you, you mentioned you had seven tools in order to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the action and how can we boost our confidence? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the number one tool is. I call develop an appetite for mastery. Really get into challenges, meaning like when you encounter a challenge, um, enjoy it and enjoy the accomplishment of that challenge, whether it be like climbing a mountain. Um, a couple of years ago, I was on a hike and I was climbing up a really, really steep hill and I have a mild fear of heights and I was very uncomfortable. My heart was starting to beat and I just talked to myself and got myself up that hill because I thought, I'm gonna master this. I really wanna get to the top. So when we develop like um, that appetite, then we start to enjoy those challenges. And then confidence is like a muscle that you build. So the more that you overcome challenges, the stronger you get, and then the more capable you become at overcoming all kinds of challenges. But what happened when you came up all the way 
to the peak of the mountain. I felt amazing. Did you feel like you could do anything? I felt like I could do anything. And you know what? I came down from that mountain with more confidence because I overcame a challenge. And now you don't have to climb a mountain in order to get this, but just to embrace a very small challenge in your day. Like, I don't feel like going to yoga. Yeah, and you know? going into and your going car anywhere. and going to yoga anyway. Showing up and doing it anyway. But why, why, why do, what do you think are the blocks or why, why we procrastinate in those types of actions that we know we're gonna feel better and still there's something that it's like, don't go there, stay in the couch, stay in Facebook. <laughs> right, stay on Facebook, that's a big one. Um, well, I think like sometimes self-sabotage mechanisms can step in. So that's true, the sabotage? Uh, I believe so, yeah. And, and why we self-sabotage is even a larger conversation. Um, there's many, many different reasons why we do that or why we procrastinate. But I would say like, let's give an example. If you wake up in the morning and you know you wanna go work out or go to yoga and you don't, that's okay. You know, write it off, give yourself some love and compassion about that. But there will be something else you encounter during your day that you feel a challenge in overcoming. So when you start to notice those little challenges and progressively step across them, that's how we get more confident. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great one. Like right now, even for me, I was on a plane yesterday, so I have like a slight lower back pain. And for me, it's a challenge to sit up straight for the show. Mm. But that gives me confidence, right? Yeah. That's amazing because yeah. now it's not only like I'm dealing with this like lower back pain, it's like using that pain per se to gain confidence. Absolutely. And you touched on something that is so true. It's like, in all the women that I've ever worked with, we're all doing things that challenge us and overcoming them. But as women, we tend to not recognize that. So it's more a matter of stopping to recognize where you're rocking your life, where you're showing up despite forces inner or outer that make it hard for you to do that. Just pause and give yourself some love and some kudos for facing those challenges. Because we tend to be superheroes, you want to be Wonder Womans, and that's also an illusion. It's not real that we can be perfect or do everything in a day. So I think it's lacking, you know, those moments where we can sit down and celebrate even little things. Like if I drank one more glass of water, yep. like celebrate that. Because yep. that, that's nourishing, right? That's the validation we usually take from the exterior to bring it into ourselves. Right, but that self-validation, I think, is what you're talking about. That's mm -hmm. so important to build confidence. And like I say, it's a muscle. You know, we can't just like sort of think or dream or imagine our way into more confidence. We actually have to work at it. And when we understand how very simple and easy these steps are, it can be a lot of fun and really bring you a lot of pleasure. I know, I, I see what you do and I love to see you online in your courses because you're always like all smiley and passionate about what you do. <laughs> so uh, the step number two? Step two is the power of positive thought. Ooh. Our thinking. So yeah. we know today science has proven that our thoughts create our feelings. And this is because thoughts generate from the frontal cortex, which is the front part of the brain, and communicates to the limbic system which is the reptilian midbrain. It controls our thinking, our feelings, I'm sorry. So our thoughts control our feelings. So if we wanna feel good, we have to think good. We have to think good thoughts. And so I say- Happy thoughts. Happy thoughts, you know, I always say like, become your best cheerleader. Become your own best friend, your own cheerleading squad, and talk yourself into achievement. So back to the example, you get up in the morning, you don't feel like working out. Talk yourself there, I can do it. I can do this, it's gonna be amazing, I can do anything I want. Even just saying that right now, quite honestly, I feel better. Yeah. So learn to speak kindly and positively to yourself. Yeah, instead of the conversation, there you go again, you're so lazy, you're so stupid, mm -hmm. you're gonna keep being fat. Like all those, you know, sabotaging and like bad conversations we have with ourselves, like just like a little thought form can shift like your energy, your perspective. 
your confidence. Absolutely shifts everything. Because okay. we know, remember, your thoughts create your feelings. So sometimes I felt I was crazy because like in my mirror and in, in my bathroom with the <laughs> lipstick, I put like happy thoughts, you know, because sometimes I, I get up and I'm a little grumpy, like I'm not a morning person. Yeah. And actually I had one that is like, I am a morning person and I'm feeling great. <laughs> you <laughs> know, like to get out of you. that, to get out of like, Oh, I'm not a morning person. Like, uh, it's like eight o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> thank you for, for just, you know, acknowledging that I'm not crazy. What's the third one? Not crazy. <laughs> you're, in fact, you're doing something great. So key number three is make friends with failure. Now I say failure like this because I don't believe in failure. I just believe that when we attempt something and we don't get the result that we want, it's nature's way of sending us back to the drawing board and being more creative in the way that we attempt things. So when we make an attempt and we don't get the result that we want and we come back and we try it again, um, it teaches the brain, helps the brain to learn and to rehearse certain skill sets that are important for our survival and for our success. If we attempt something and we fail at it and we don't try again, then it deprives the brain, the body, mind, and spirit from actually absorbing and retaining all of those rich and potent lessons that we would have learned had we tried again. So don't let failure bring you down or make you quit. Keep trying. It's like the little kids. You know, I observe my niece and nephew, and they can't, they're not good at something, and they do it again, mm -hmm. and they do it again, and they do it again until they get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when they fail the first time, they're I'm scared, I don't like it. And then they do it the next day and they figure it out and they're like, I love it. And that boosts confidence. Yeah. Because they nailed it from trying again and again. So it's not really, do you think it's also, I mean, failure, but expectation? Mm -hmm. You know, because we, we society expects so much for, from women. And then our expectations are not real. Mm -hmm. So also maybe a good thing would be to have less expectations. Well, or to have to have realistic expectations realistic. is I what like it is. It. Because I want us to still have expectations of ourselves. And it is very much culturally based. Western cultures really don't believe that failure is a positive experience. Whereas Eastern cultures, and I've done a lot of reading about this, in Asian cultures, specifically Japanese cultures, they will actually architect or orchestrate experiments for their children in which they know the child is going to fail. Um, and they set the child up to do that in order to help build resiliency and resolve in the child and in order to build confidence. Whereas in Western cultures, you know, we see our child fail at something, let's say they don't win a race, or let's say they don't get an A on the paper, then it's like, we're angry and we're punishing and because they're supposed to be perfect the first time. Mm. Whereas, you know, children and adults alike, we need to attempt things repetitively. So I wanna say, if you have tried something and you've gotten less than your perfect result, then let that be an invitation for you to try again in a more creative and maybe more focused way. And that's how we build confidence. And that's amazing and that's super true. Um, about a month ago, I went into a, a store and I saw hula hoop. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna yeah. do it. I haven't done it like in 30 <laughs> <Okay>. years. <laughs> and last weekend, I did it for the third time and I stayed for two hours practicing until I got it. Yeah. And now it's like I went, I bought my hula hoop and I'm practicing every day because I want to be good at it. Yeah. But I see it more like I'm learning something new, which is good, like you say, for the brain. And it feels amazing because it's like still I have the capacity to be open and learn. Yeah, and to, I have a hoop in my living room too, oh, so really? let's we get together and together. hoop together. <laughs> yeah, that would be so much fun. <laughs> I used to be really big into hoop dancing, and in part because it actually does build your confidence because you drop that hoop so many times or like you mess up or you don't get the move right, but then you practice and then you get it. See, and this is like more and more what we're missing in Western cultures is this belief that we just need to practice things in order to be good at them. And that's how the brain develops its sense of competency. So if you, let me give you an example. When you practice that hoop and you finally get the move that you've been trying, the next time you go to stand in the mirror before that date, you're gonna feel better about the way you look because the brain will borrow, this is mastery, remember, the brain will borrow that sense of competency that you developed from the hoop 
and place it onto your self-perception, the way you see yourself. Oh, really? I didn't try that. <laughs> okay, tomorrow I'm going to hula hoop, and after that I'm going to go and stand naked in the mirror <laughs> and just love myself. Yeah, let's see what happens. Oh my god, there's no more cellulite! <laughs> the hoop! <laughs> <laughs> no, it will be more like, here's my cellulite, and it's awesome, and I yeah, feel great. You exactly. Know, you don't care. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, don't care about things. So yeah. we, we touched on the first one, and uh, which is uh -huh. which was the first one you got? So the first one is develop an appetite for challenge. For challenge. Mm -hmm. The second one? The power of positive thought. Okay. The third one? Make friends with failure. Yeah. And let's go to the fourth. Okay. Play outside your comfort zone. Oh, 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 that's a big one. <laughs> now this can be really fun because I'm a pleasure junkie. I'm gonna like frame everything in this way with pleasure. Getting uncomfortable, even just a little bit every day is really important to stretch that muscle of self-perception to broaden and expand your sense of yourself. So it can be something really small. Like a lot of the women I work with, I give them assignments to like go eat at a restaurant alone if that's something that you're uncomfortable with. Or the next time your mother calls you and you're feeling irritated or agitated from a conversation, let her know why. You know, be more assertive in your communications or more transparent, more honest. That's stretching outside of our comfort zone. And look, I don't want you to go like springing outside of the comfort zone or like bounding outside of it. I want you to take little tiny micro steps and to stretch yourself. So is it okay to feel uncomfortable? Because, I mean, I have to be totally honest with you guys. <laughs> English is not my second language. And when I do the show still, I feel my English is not that great, or I pause a lot on my grammar, and I'm a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But there's a beauty to that uncomfortability. Mm -hmm. But still, there's a part of me that it's like, I'm going to be judged or not validated. So it's that natural. That's totally natural, and I'm going to cover that in the next key. But the last thing I want to say about getting outside your comfort zone is like, was, <laughs> is why that is so important. It's because, so let's say um, there's something outside your comfort zone, like being honest with a potential date. Okay, oh, let's, yeah. say, let's say someone asks you out on a date and you really aren't feeling it and you really don't want to go. And just say, I'm not feeling it? Oh, it's in kindly and compassionately <laughs> to say, you know, I, this doesn't feel like a fit for me, thank you, mm. but I'm going to pass. Maybe that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. The brain registers that and the brain says, well, if you can survive that level of discomfort, it, I call it a dysregulation of your nervous system. If you can survive that and you come out okay from it, then you could survive something even a little bit bigger than that, mm. such as asking for a raise, such as breaking up with your no good boyfriend, such as looking in the mirror and loving your cellulite. So we begin to stretch just like any muscle. Stretch, mm. stretch, stretch, stretch until you're fluid and limber and amazing. <clears throat> that, makes, that, that makes a lot of sense. Because sometimes yeah. we push our heart, like we, we go to our edges, mm -hmm. and there's no need. It's like... And we pull a muscle. Little by little. Right. That's what I'm after. We don't want to like... You don't oh go to yoga. Oh, thank you. That gave me <laughs> such peace of mind because <laughs> okay. I'm edgy. So it's nice to say, okay, just a little bit. like it's Moderation. Yeah, like saying no to a guy in that way. Thank you. Yeah. Good. That's a great one. So <laughs> let's go to the fifth. Okay. The fifth one is... Self-compassion. Now I want to explain like why self-compassion is connected to confidence. And most people don't understand. They're like, shouldn't you push yourself in order to be more confident? Yeah. And I want to say that the opposite is true. Um, so one of my teachers explains it this way, um, Kristen Neff. She talks about how self-compassion is a safety net of life. So let's imagine, let's say you are a trapeze artist. Okay, and you're in the circus and you're swinging, you know, back and forth from swing to swing. And in order to catch the next swing, you have to let go of the one you're currently holding. So if you were practicing this beautiful trapeze act without a safety net, you would be less likely to let go of that first swing and then grab onto the second swing. Because if you fall, you're gonna die. 
But if you have a safety net underneath you, then it's okay to take risks, to embrace challenges, to do all the other steps that have come before you. Because if you fall, you're going to be held. Oh, I love that one. So when we forgive ourselves, when we're soft with ourselves, when we're loving to ourselves, no matter what happens, even if we fail or we don't meet a challenge, it's okay, you'll just get up and try again. And remember, one of the key elements of building confidence is repetition, trying again and again and again. So by all means, I encourage you, Karina, and everybody watching to develop a practice of self-love. It's so important for confidence. How can you love yourself? Because, I mean, sometimes we do affirmations for positive thoughts, but what kind of actions can I take also in an everyday life to nourish mm -hmm. that part of myself? Or all myself. Yeah. Not that part, all the parts of myself. All the parts of you. There's so many wonderful... Even the ones I don't like that much. Okay, here's an, an idea. So I have so many ideas on this front. I'm gonna give you one that's super powerful. Okay. It's about loving your body, okay? So if you have a daily practice of, I call it the self-love shower, of just tracing your fingertips across your entire body, kind of like a feather touch. Yeah, you got it, almost like petting and stroking yourself. Ooh. Yeah, just making contact yeah. with your skin in this way, and then maybe letting your hands stop at a place on your body where you typically judge yourself or, or criticize yourself, right? My butt. Yeah. <laughs> For most women, you know. Yeah, hips, you know, hips, the hips butt, breasts, the butt. I mean, you name it. We all have parts of our body that we are ashamed of or that we hide, and really spending time like loving that part of your body up. Mm. So that's a wonderful self love practice. And you can do it in the shower, you can do it in the bathtub, you can do it when you're changing, just, just stopping to really appreciate your body and not the way it looks, not the aesthetic of your body, but the function of your body. So for example, loving your legs. You know, I like to love my legs because I don't like my legs. I love my legs and say thank you for carrying me. Thank you for walking me. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for getting me places that I want to go. Like, my legs are actually miracles in the way that they function in the whole of my body temple. I don't have to love the way they look, but I love who they are. And what they do. And what they do. Yeah, yeah. the gratitude. Gratitude. And, and I mean, something important about this, because right now, just even, you know, doing this exercise while you were talking about it, when I, when I came to my hips, which is a part that I've never really loved or like, there's, there's this feeling that I was loving it, but I feel like I want to cry. Mm -hmm. So is that natural, where, natural, where you feel that acceptance and love that we want to cry or, or feel vulnerable? It's very natural. I can't tell you how many women cry when they first do this exercise because they realize how they have starved themselves for love. They realize how they've been judging and condemning and berating their own bodies. And it's almost like a grief. You know, they're grieving all the years that they have done this to themselves and then understanding how easy it is just to reverse that script, reverse that conversation and turn it into a loving one. It makes us very tender. Mm. Yeah. Oh, but that's beautiful vulnerability. Yeah. Especially, I mean, in women and in men too. I love men when they cry. But anyway, coming back to women, I always get distracted. So we've got we one more key. Our seventh key, right? Yes, and Woo! this is maybe my favorite key of all. Okay. It's called pleasure. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. I love you, McClay. Okay, so tell me about pleasure. Okay, so you might be thinking, what does pleasure have to do with confidence? Pleasure has everything to do with confidence, especially for women. And, really? this, and this is why. Okay, so I'm gonna geek out on brain science. Okay, <laughs> geek it out. <laughs> when women are in pleasure, there are three basic categories of neurochemicals that get released. Dopamine, oxytocin, and opioids and endorphins. They're the same category. Opioids and endorphins. Endorphins, and now they do, they do three different things, and I wanna break it down briefly for you. So, Dopamine is kind of like the ultimate feminist chemical, neurochemical. Dopamine has been correlated um, in recent research to levels of confidence in women, levels of assertion in women, and levels of talkativity, which is really interesting. So women who have high levels of dopamine are like ready to conquer the world. 
And they talk a lot. They talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they do, which makes sense Shh. because women like to talk after we have sex. Yeah. <laughs> Men don't. Women do. Because we're getting this like rush of dopamine. Mm. Um, it's this amazing chemical, part of the reward center of the brain. The second um, neurochemical is oxytocin, oxytocin, which like most of us know what that is. Like, I love oxytocin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. Yeah. So oxytocin is like the love hormone. It's responsible for our sense of bonding, our sense of connectivity and, and intimacy and love. Mm. So the third neurochemical uh, is this class of chemicals called opioids and endorphins. And these chemicals make us feel like existential bliss and joy and this sort of like the sense of transcendence. It's like that, a- That natural high? Yeah, it's like a God feeling. It's a very spiritual feeling. I can even feel it right now while you talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, so you can make contact with that. So this is what I call the pleasure cocktail. When you're getting dopamine, opioids and endorphins, and oxytocin. Those three together, it's a triple threat. It floods the body with pleasure. And it doesn't have to be sexual pleasure, just any kind of pleasure, such as savoring your food or a really amazing massage. So it actually wires the brain to be more confident and more assertive and more um, self-assured in one's body. Um, now, here's an interesting question I get a lot, like, well, what if I masturbate? Does that do the trick? What if I have sex? Does that do the trick? So we look at the relationship between these three neurochemicals. If you're getting pleasure without love, so you're getting the dopamine and the opioids and endorphins without the oxytocin, mm. then you're getting kind of like... Um, not the full cocktail. You're not getting the full cocktail. You're getting like a virgin daiquiri. You know, oh, you're not yeah. you're not getting the, the full punch. The, yeah, <laughs> you're getting the the um, the Shirley Temple drink yeah. instead of like the margarita or the martini. So um, it really needs to be all three of these together, ideally. And so coupling connection and intimacy and love with your pleasure is the most impactful pleasure cocktail, and it will make you more confident. And think about women who are in their pleasure, yeah. sexual or otherwise are ready to conquer the world. It's like they're um, untamable. They're wild. They're not controllable. And society knows this. And it's a big part of why pleasure for women has been suppressed for so long. Yes. And to have the full <laughs> cocktail really, really gets you on. And like you say, there's many ways to have that. So if I have that connection and that intimacy and passion for something I'm doing, mm -hmm. like work or a hike or dancing, that's that those are sort of like the three elements to get the full cocktail. You bet. And you can orchestrate that. And then people like feel it and smell it and they they just want to hang out with you. Totally. Like when I met you, I was like, I want to hang with Iggy Bell Clay, <laughs> you know? Like I didn't know it was this cocktail. Like it took you a while <laughs> to share that information with me. <laughs> but I'm happy to have cocktails with you anytime. Anytime. Yeah, because I mean, and that's the beauty. We can find pleasure in so many things. For me, it's, it's all about being in nature. Mm -hmm. That brings me so much pleasure enjoy so give ourselves also time every single day to love each other boost our confidence like be in tune with the pleasures of life and celebrate ourselves as women absolutely and some very simple practices you can do is like just walk through your neighborhood and smell the flowers you know feel the breeze on your skin there's pleasure happening all around us all the time we're just like too busy to notice or we're not connected to those centers within ourselves so there's your invitation so be in your pleasure practice and start to watch how it shifts your confidence well thank you so much for being here where, where do people can find you your website yeah evaclay.com Perfect. Thank you so yeah. much, Eva. Thank you, It was sweetie. a pleasure yeah. having you here. Great. So Hope you fun. can come back soon and geek us out with some more neuroscience well, and, and sex because, like, yeah, <laughs> we, we need to talk about sex, too. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. Thank you. Thank you all for being here in Coffee, Tea, or Sex. Follow us at our Facebook page, Coffee, Tea, or Sex, and see you next time. Don't forget to tune into some pleasure in your life.